Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and Taylor is not with me today because today is what I'm unofficially calling Interview Friday. Today's guest interview is freelance writer Noah Davis. Noah is someone I knew a little bit before recording this interview. We used to guest together on the American Soccer Now in 10 or 15 minutes podcast, and I really enjoyed chatting with him. Noah is a freelance writer who has been published pretty much everywhere and recently wrote for Howler Magazine, a long-form profile of US soccer president Sunil Galati. To write that story, Noah spent a lot of time with Galati, even attended some of his economics lectures at Columbia, and so he's uniquely positioned to offer a good take on the man who's been in charge of US soccer for the past 12 years and has been involved for even longer. I recommend you listen to this interview, but of course I would say that because this is my show. I also talked to Noah about his own freelance writing career. Some really good advice in there for any aspiring writers. And of course, toward the end, we talk some US men's national team with Noah letting me know what he'd like to see the US do against Panama one week from today. Of course, Taylor will be back with me on Sunday, where we'll do our now traditional thumbs up, thumbs down weekend review. Plus, we'll take a look at Bruce Arena's US men's national team roster for the games against Panama and Trinidad and Tobago. That's assuming the roster is released Sunday evening. That's what we think is going to happen. Uh, final reminder, we have Total Soccer Show t-shirts with the website logo on sale at totalsoccershow.com slash merch, but only until September 30th. Link is in the show notes if you'd like to get one. Okay, enough from Solo Me, on to today's interview. Hello there to Noah Davis, I assume in Brooklyn, am I correct? I am in Brooklyn. Well, hey. Yes. And this is, I'm quite excited to talk to you here because, not just about the Galati story for Howler that we're going to talk about, I'm excited because I haven't talked to you for longer than 10 or 15 minutes and without John Arnold in the middle. <laughs> that that is true. I will miss John Arnold. Maybe we can just call him up uh, sometime yeah. in the middle of this conversation. And you we'll know, have, text him at least. And we'll have him ask me a question and then ask you the same question. But we don't get to talk to each other directly. That was the setup on American Soccer Now in ten or fifteen minutes, right? Yeah, that sounds good. We'll try and <laughs> triangulate it. <laughs> so it's going to be weird talking directly to you, but I'm excited to do it. Um, I've re- I've read FIFA 101. Uh, my copy of Howler Magazine arrived um, in the mail two days ago. Um, I've read your story, FIFA, well, sorry, FIFA 101. I really like it. It's a really well-reported story. So first of all, congratulations. I get the feeling that a lot of hours went into it. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, a lot of hours did go into it, which uh, is one of the things that I like about Howler is they will give you a lot of hours. They may not give you the money to compensate for those hours, but, <laughs> but they try hard. Uh, and, and George is a wonderful editor. But yeah, I mean, I, I started reporting that story more than a year ago, actually, um, George Qureshi, the editor of Howler, and I were talking about Sunil uh, actually at a soccer tournament in Brooklyn, I think last July, and then kind of got going. I went to Sunil's class and watched him teach a class at Columbia pretty early fall semester last year, so I think you know early September, um, and then talked to him throughout, you know, on and off for the next six to eight months, and then kind of started writing it. So. Yeah, I mean, when we got to the final draft, it had changed a little bit. And, uh, you know, Klinsman was still the coach when I started reporting it. So he's obviously not been the coach for quite some time. Um, right. So a lot, a lot of time, um, you know, Sunil was incredibly generous with his time. Um, there's a part in the piece where I mentioned that he was emailing back and forth with me during, you know, the exact moment that the women's, the CBA deal was coming down. And I was sort of amazed at his ability to multitask um and also to multitask on the level of minutia of you know answering <laughs> my dumb questions from from some reporter um well how did you so, I've, my big question is how did you get such access because i i honestly the 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 busyness of sunil galati would suggest to me that he hasn't got time to spend multiple you know multiple phone calls and it seems like person-to-person conversations um, with a reporter for one story. So like when you said that I went to his class, did you, did you sneak into his class at Columbia or <laughs> no. was, there, was there a reach out and a setup of like, Hey, we're going to do this feature about you. Um, can I, can I get some of your time? Yeah. So we, we reached out to, uh, Neil Beathy, who's the U S press person and said, we're interested in doing a profile of Sunil. And, um, I talked to Neil, you know, I've known him for 10 years now from reporting on the U S team. So, okay. um, I, I think he, he understands, um, you know, not, he didn't, he didn't ask what, what exactly was going to be in the story, but he said kind of, you know, what are you thinking and, and kind of what's the angle? And I just said, look, I, I don't think that there has been a good profile of Sunil 
uh, generally, I think there are a lot of good profiles of Sunil at moments in time, you know, Mm -hmm. sort of there's like, there's a good profile. I think Grant Wall wrote one, um, maybe when Sunil got on the executive committee and then there's a couple, you know, from the late nineties, early two thousands when he kind of became us president. But I said, I, I don't think there's one that kind of encompasses all of what Sunil has done, which is really an impressive body of work. And I, I think part of that too is because, you know, there hasn't been a magazine like Howler. There hasn't been the audience for that. You're not going to write a, you know, 5,000 word profile of Sunil Gulati in the New York Times magazine or something like that. Um, but I would love to do it if they came to me, but you know, <laughs> he, he's kind of, he's not, uh, he, he's not the sexiest guy, but I think he's, he's extremely important in terms of us soccer. So there, there's just not a lot of, there weren't any really locations for that where that would make sense. Um, so, you know, I, I told Neil kind of gave him that spiel, um, a little more awkwardly, but, uh, you know, I figured it out. Uh, and then said, he said, okay, well, what do you want? I said, well, I'd like to, you know, talk to Sunil and, and go to his class. Um, and so we set that up and then, uh, I think had, you know, some follow up phone calls, some that I set up with Neil, but mostly I would just email Sunil and I said, Hey, I have some follow up questions for you. Um, you know, do you have time to talk? And invariably he had time to talk, which was, um, you know, like I said, very generous of him and, and a little shocking. And, and I think he is, you know, very busy, but he's, he's very, very good at accomplishing things and, and getting things done. And, and this was one of the things that, um, you know, he, he felt like he needed to do. So that's how it kind of worked out. And so reading the story, the big impression I got of like seeing like almost his almost his whole career arc, right? There's maybe another term as US soccer president in there to, still to come, right? Um, but you get the sort of the feeling early on of the guy getting things done because the rest of the organization isn't. And this is like a young Sunil Galati, right? This is the Sunil Galati who's um, essentially helping host a training camp and he's sort of going out and buying soccer balls from, I believe, Kmart. And he's like sending 17-page letters saying, um, here's what you're doing wrong, here's what you should be doing. Um, And he just seems really proactive as a young man trying to make change in US soccer when the federation was really, it seems, struggling to to provide a, like a professional environment for national team players. Um, and the feeling I got from the piece, and tell me if I'm wrong, because I may be reading this incorrectly, is that as he's accumulated more power, now he's a bit more like he's the guy not doing anything, he's a bit more reactive and not at the forefront of positive change. Uh, yeah, I think maybe that's that's a little a little harsh. I think that he has made some positive changes. I think the, the criticism that I heard very much is that he's a little he's a little reactive, or he will wait. Kind of wants to stay the course. I think um, you know he's he's a cautious guy. Uh, I think it was easier to make those proactive changes back in the you know late late eighties, early nineties when U.S. soccer was, or even earlier than that in the seventies when U.S. soccer was not the you know, hundred million dollar entity that it is today. Um, sort of the old analogy of, you know, it it used to be a, a destroyer or a small or a small sailboat and now it's a aircraft carrier or something (laughs) like that. You know, I think, I think it, it takes, there's, there's a lot more at stake now, um, than there was before. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I think he is cautious. I think one of the criticisms is that he's too cautious. I think there are certainly some merits to that. Um, I also think that he's done a pretty impressive job of, you know, playing a, a key role in, in leading U.S. soccer to where it is today, um, and has maybe earned some of those rights to to be cautious. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's fair. I mean, I think he's sort of this initially kind of this young, um, ambitious go getter. I think now he's an older, still ambitious go getter who's um, <laughs> going a, a little bit slower, both by design and also just by the practical realities of where U.S. soccer is compared to where it was. 30 years ago. I guess that's just aging as well anyway, right? I guess everybody's sort of a, a young go-getter when you're young and everybody gets a little more, you know, conservative, not politically, but conservative in terms of actions as you as you get older. I think you maybe consider things more and you're less likely to write. I think the, the story was that he wrote a 17-page letter because someone had specifically told him not to write a 17-page letter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Warner <laughs> Fricker, who was the head of the Federation, Sunil ran his camp and sort of saw... Uh, all the all the organizational problems that he saw uh, with the camp and you know how there weren't balls that he had to go buy them at Kmart <laughs> and there, there weren't pennies or whatever and so um, you know he asked Warner Fricker if he could make some suggestions and Fricker said yeah don't but don't put it in a 17 page memo and Sunil wrote a 17 page memo which you know <laughs> I, I mean is a it's it, it happened it's but it's exactly uh, you know that that's that's Sunil in, in a nutshell um, and that makes me really like know, him sorry that makes me really like him. 
Yeah, I, I think there were. I mean, a lot of those stories are, you know, he's he's an incredibly ambitious guy. And I think ambition, um, you know, it, it can be a dirty word um, for, for good reason and understandably. But there is also something important about ambition. And I think that, you know, from reading a lot about Sunil as a younger man and now and talking to him a lot, um, there is certainly an incredible amount of ambition. But he does you know, want us soccer to be in a better place. And he has a vision for how to do that. And whether, you know, you may not agree with that vision, but, um, he's done his best to try to enact that vision. And I think, you know, a lot of the decisions he's made has been correct. And he's gotten, you know, he's, he's helped move us soccer along, uh, in a pretty dramatic way in the past 30 years. I mean, I think that's another thing that, you know, I, I understood a little bit when I started reporting the piece, but really learned a lot more about, you know, where U.S. soccer was in 1990, um, you know, which was basically nowhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they had – there was one training camp, I think it was in you know the late 80s, where the players, they had to make a decision whether to forego their per diem so that they could afford another training, you know, another day of training uh, so they could afford the wow. hotel or something like that. And, you know, it's like – you think about that and you know 1988 or or whenever exactly that date was um that's not that long ago Mm -hmm. and uh to now you know where they're spending millions of dollars on training facilities for the world cup and stuff like that i mean it's a it's a huge change from where they've come so and i think like i said i mean there are certainly decisions that i disagree with and i think you know there are a lot of things that Sunil has done that you can take umbrage with, uh, but I, I think generally his heart is in the right place, and most of the things that he's done have, have turned out positively. Perhaps that we could be, you know, the U.S. Soccer Federation and program could be further along, um, and I think there are mistakes he's made along the way, but uh, a lot of it has worked out. Yeah, do you think um, maybe it's fair to say that because there's quite a few people have come to soccer late or so you know maybe they've come in after the 2010 world cup or what have you that they don't appreciate the full arc of Sunil galati's career and what like everything that you just mentioned about you know moving the program forward in the past 30 years and his involvement from the you know the uh the sort of more menial jobs of buying soccer balls uh, all the way up to being president and you know the sailboat to uh, um, what did you say? Aircraft carrier uh, yeah. <laughs> tra- transformation. And because the, the biggest anti Sunil stuff I heard was basically when people were so frustrated with Jurgen Klinsmann wanted him fired. And then like, they almost like just went up the ladder to be like, okay, if he's not going to, if he's not going to be fired, who should be firing him? It should be Galati. We want Galati out. And then no one had looked at maybe the, the bigger scope of his career. So, and I'm assuming you agree with that based on everything you've just said, but is your hope that maybe this story informs people of what Sinor Galati has done over the long term? I think it would be nice if people read it and, and realize that. I mean, um, that was certainly one of my goals and, and also yeah. just sort of as a soccer journalist to educate myself too. I mean, I went back and there's a couple books about, you know, early MLS that I went back and read um, that are really interesting. And you kind of just to sort of assume now sitting here in 2017, or as you said, you know, if you came in in 2010 or, you know, even 2002, I mean, that was sort of the first world cup Mm -hmm. I really seriously got into. And um, you kind of assume that soccer was always just headed for this upward trajectory in the U S and that's really not, it's not not really true. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of people that have done a lot to make that happen. And and Sunil has been one of the major ones. So I I do think it's important to kind of understand where the U S program has come from. Um, I also think that there are very valid criticisms about Sunil, um, and some of the things he's done lately, I think, you know, extending Klinsman before the 2014 world cup was, was nuts to me. That never really made sense. Um, did you guys talk about that? Um, we did a little bit, you know, he was very, um, cautious. He's a, he's a very calculating person in terms of what he says. And, um, I think, you know, we, we talked a little bit about, there wasn't, he didn't really say anything interesting about that. Um, Got it. So I think other, other, maybe his, his thing was like, oh, I don't want to give him a quote that he can definitely use to build a couple paragraphs about Klinsman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. He knows, Sunil knows exactly what he's saying at all times. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he still has, he has the charm and he has the humor, but he is in control of, uh, his rhetoric at all times, which is, it's pretty impressive in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> and you know, so I, I just think it's important to, uh, you know, to recognize where the U S program has come from that said, and, and Sunil said this too. He said, you know, um, 
it's completely fair to criticize if the program is not moving forward now. I mean, you know, yeah. you don't, you don't get credit. It's the whole, uh, you know, to use another hackney metaphor, it's like the, no one cares that you walked uphill in the snow both ways, uh, because you're not walking uphill in the snow anymore. Like now you have a car. So, um, you know, you want a nice car. Uh, and, and Sunil talked about that. He said, you know, I, I don't think that, um, I, I think he would like people to understand where the program was, but also, you know, it, it's, it's important for the fans to demand progress and demand continued progress. And that's the thing that keeps people accountable. Is it fair to say that maybe, um, now that, you know, U S soccer is this kind of, um, aircraft carrier that maybe his goals as U S soccer president have become more about making sure the U S hosts a world cup. Like, so rather than sort of reforming, sort of, you know, making sure there's enough practice gear and making sure the commercial stuff is in place, which maybe he feels like he's done enough um, to, you know, make U.S. soccer more of a force, that it's more about uh, the U.S.'s um, international standing and specifically hosting a World Cup. Like, maybe that's like the later stage of his career is about is all about that. Yeah, I think that would be the, a nice cap on uh, his career is bringing the U.S., the, bringing the World Cup back to the U.S. I think he was crushed when they didn't get the 2022 World Cup. I mean, mm-hmm. he can, you know, uh, he knows the date of that as November 8th, 2010, I think, or something, something along those lines, whatever, whatever that day was of the vote. I mean, that, that date rolls off his tongue um, immediately and with pretty significant venom. Because uh, he feels like he failed. I think he feels like he failed. I think he feels like it was a, um, pretty bad situation from a, a number of different perspectives um, mm-hmm. and just kind of a terrible, a terrible process throughout. Um, and, you know, I think with all of the FIFA stuff that we've seen, it's, you know, I think it's fair to say that it was at least corrupt in, in some ways. Um, and I think that was an incredibly disappointing moment for him and frustrating moment for him. Um, I think it did in some ways lead to things that gave him more power within FIFA because a lot of the you know, a lot of the actors involved in FIFA were brought down, not as a direct result of that, but, um, you know, certainly developed a lot more scrutiny from the Department of Justice and various other organizations because of, you know, at least in part because of what happened on that day. Um, so, yeah, I think he certainly wants to bring the World Cup back to the U.S. I and mean, that would be a, he played a pretty big role in getting it in 94. He was on the, on that committee as well. Um, mm-hmm. Not that not the top guy, but. You know that would be a that would be a great cap on his career to see the see the World Cup come back to the U.S. in 2026 and Mexico and Canada um, and have sort of this you know pan North American event with a billion teams <laughs> and uh, you know a ton of money uh, involved and you know I, I think by 2026 the U.S. team ought to be pretty good too so there's always there's always that as well. <laughs> a lot of people will be familiar with the image of Gulati sort of working the room. And essentially, essentially getting um, Gianni Infantino uh, or helping heavily in in his election, and I, that's the time I first realised that Sonogalati Galati is more than just uh, the US soccer guy, but who really does play a um, a role of influence in world soccer on on a much 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 bigger level. That's addressed in the story um, as well, and I always wondered if maybe that was that was a reaction to maybe 2010, like that was him deciding, all right, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to um, sort of play the game in a smart way and make things happen. Does, it, that, does that sound uh, like an accurate representation? I don't know if you guys specifically talked about that. I think, uh, I mean, that specific moment, he he told me he didn't know he was on television or there was, you know, he didn't know that Fox had the Gulati cam, right. you know, sort of following him around. Um, oh, wasn't until, there a text message? Yeah. I think, yeah, I think Alexi Lala sent him a text message and said, you know, something like, you know, you know, we're following you, right? Or something. He said, no, I, I had no idea. Um, and I, I asked him about it. He said sort of just the, the sheer logistics of that situation meant that he basically had to do all that politicking on the floor um, rather than in the back rooms and stuff like that, because I think they took the vote very quickly. Um, they they t- took the second round vote very quickly. And, um, you know, so they, they, went, they didn't go away anywhere and, and have private conversations. Um, so logistically, I, I don't think that he quite anticipated what was going to happen. But I think the, um, the wielding of the power and figuring out how to do that and gaining allegiances, um, that was very calculated, too. I, I also think that, um, you know, if he could have had more power for the 2018-2022 
votes, he, he would have done that. I think it, it's, it took a long time for him to consolidate that power. Um, partially just as he went up the FIFA ladder and mm -hmm. everyone else fell around him. Um, and partially just because he's always playing the long game. So, you know, he, the first step was get on, you know, the first step was be us president and then it was get onto the FIFA executive committee. And then it was, you know, build your power within the FIFA executive committee. So I don't think he had the power in the past. It's not that he didn't wield it. It's that it just didn't exist for him. Um, you know, it, it's kind of wild that there's an American who's one of the, most powerful people in FIFA, yeah. maybe not, um, you know, maybe not the face. I bet if you handed out a picture of Sunil Gulati to, um, a lot of soccer fans around the world, they would have no idea who he was. Um, so he's certainly not the face of the sport. Um, but I think he, you know, he's, I, I don't know, what do you want to say? Like one of the top 25 most powerful people in world soccer, maybe like something, something around there, maybe a little bit less, but you know, I mean, certainly in FIFA, um, one of one of the top which is pretty impressive for a you know guy from the u.s who uh is also a professor at columbia right <laughs> i'm also i'm interested in the sort of obviously chuck blazer got taken down and i get the feeling that galati genuinely is someone who goes by the book and is too smart to get himself in any trouble and not and i'm not saying like smart as in hiding what he's doing i i genuinely think he he does not get involved in anything uh, that's too shady. Um, and I noticed you, you sort of addressed it over a couple of paragraphs. Um, is, did you essentially come to the same conclusion? Um, someone who worked pretty closely with Sunil uh, back in the MLS days sent me an email after the uh, piece came out. And he said, you know, I, I like the piece. Um, and he said that one of his friends, when all the stuff with Blazer went down, one of his friends asked this guy, he said, you know, do you think that Sunil is involved in Blazer? And the guy who had worked closely with, with Blazer said, or with, with Sunil said, no, uh, the difference between Sunil and Chuck is that Chuck cared about money and Sunil only cares about power. Interesting. And, okay. And you can accumulate power without sort of any corruption, really, right? Just by yeah. wor essentially working the room and giving people what they want and making some exactly. relationships. And, yeah. and being very political and, you know, I mean, like with ambition, I think power power can be a dirty word too. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think that sort of perfectly encapsulates the, the Sunil Gulati that I came to understand and, and know. Um, and I wish that I had spoken to this person before the piece came out because that's a great quote and I wish I could have used it. Um, but you know, so yeah, I think, um, I, it, you know, I, it's, it's always hard. I, I, I asked Anil, you know, pretty specifically about this because he's an economist and, um, he had presumably some access to some of some level of CONCACAF's books. And, you know, he kind of said, look, I mean, if you want to, if you want to hide something and you're, you know, a decent and you have a decent business sense, um, you can do it. It's, it's a very, it's a different thing between having suspicions that someone is acting improperly and proving it. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think that is a, um, you know, if, if you can take him at his word and, and I do, um, I think it's, you know, I guess could, could he have, could Sunil have pushed a little bit harder and, um, you know, I, I honestly don't know what the answer to that is. I think, a lot of people who criticize him say he could have, um, but I don't know any of those structures of CONCACAF. I don't know how that works. I don't think many people do. Um, I, I don't think, I think you're correct. I think he is too smart to get caught up directly in yeah. any of that. And he, also, did, he doesn't I don't think, need to fund an apartment for his cats, for example. Right, and, right. and I don't think he's interested in that. I mean, this is a guy, you know, I went to the U.S.-Mexico game in Mexico, um, this, whenever it was, in, I can't remember, June maybe? Yeah, uh, this past June, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we were on the same flight back from Mexico city. Uh, and so I flew Mexico city to Newark and, you know, was tired and cranky. Um, and I was getting on the air train from the Newark airport back to Long Island, uh, to the New Jersey transit. Uh, and if you've ever flown into Newark, it's like just terrible. Everything yeah, about it is horrible. <laughs> um, and you know, I, the only, I good, the only up, good thing about it is that it's not JFK. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I crammed myself into the air train car uh, and the doors closed and I looked up and there was Sunil waiting for the next air train. Right. Um, you know, and it's like, 
I, I, that uh, was another thing that I wish, you know, we could have gotten in there before the magazine closed, but I just felt like, you know, he could have taken uh, a car to his apart to his apartment on the Upper West Side or something like that. I mean, right. no one would no one would have criticized him for for using you know sixty dollars of U.S. soccer's a hundred million dollar surplus. Yeah, uh, so he's to, very much he's very much not Tom Price. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the op- the opposite of Tom Price. <laughs> um, so you know, and, and I think that's sort of another example of I I, I don't think that Sunil has any interest in money. Um, I think he's done he's certainly done very well for himself. Um, not very well. I, he's done well for himself, and he um, you know. But he's also worked as a U.S. soccer president. You know, that's essentially it's basically a full time job. He's done that for free for 12 years at this point. Yeah, um, that's one more thing I want to ask you about was I was really struck by um, how busy Sunil Galati seems to be with all the jobs of U.S. soccer president, all that that involves right across many teams, um, his FIFA duties, and then is still teaching um, economics at Columbia. Um, and I kind of wondered if those things were even compatible and like how he manages to, to do all that. Cause it seemed like a lot of um, flying somewhere to do a meeting, then flying back so that he could teach his class. And it, I wonder if the future of the U S soccer presidency needs to be a full-time job so that you have time to do all the things you need to do. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a good point. And I think it's something that he's thought about. I mean, I think even in the, you know, 12 years that he's been U S soccer president, the job has grown and changed. And, and also, you know, Dan Flynn, who's the CEO of the U.S. Soccer Federation, he's a full-time employee and he's he's paid. I see. Um, and, and there are, there are a lot of people who are um, paid. So it's uh, only the president is paid. Soccer. I believe so. Yeah, maybe the board members. Um, mm-hmm. I think that that is probably going to change. He talked a little bit about how you know the, the job has changed and that and it should probably be a paid position. Um, I don't think it will change under his watch. But I, I just think that the the job has expanded um, in a in a pretty dramatic way, and I think a lot of that is Sunil taking that on himself and expanding that job title. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I think I I, don't, I wonder kind of how much a non Sunil Galati U.S. soccer president would do or would have to do. Um, you know, because. Like I said, I mean, Dan Flynn does a lot of the, he does a lot of the work and he, um, and there's a hundred people who are paid employees of U.S. soccer at this point. So there's a lot of infrastructure there as well. Um, and I think, you know, there's, you could make the case that U.S. soccer president is sort of more of a figurehead position. Although I, I think that, uh, and I think maybe that's how it was initially intended. Um, and certainly, you know, 15 years ago, the job was a lot smaller and you didn't have right. to do as much. Oh, so um, there wasn't, there wasn't as much to do. So maybe Gulati the man that turned it into a sort of more, um, active presidency. I, I think, I think so. I think he, um, I mean, he's a very active person and, um, wanted to, you know, have his hands everywhere. And I think it's partially him. I think it's partially, um, you know, he fills voids and it's, partially just the, the growth of the soccer program as well. So there's there's a lot more to do, and, and there's a guy who wants to do a lot more. I think you put those two things together, and you get a pretty extensive role. A final question on this, Noah. Uh, the story is in Howler Magazine, the in the fall issue. The headline is FIFA 101. My question is, is that, was that your headline, or was that George's headline? Or was it another editor at Howler's headline? I'm always, uh, I'm always fascinated by this with, with magazines. <laughs> It was it was not my headline. Uh, the original working title was uh, Sunil Always Rises, which I thought was oh, pretty great. Oh, that's brilliant! Um, and actually, I think it's the, it's the last line of the piece. That that was George's, so I can't take credit for um, the last line of the piece. Um, and I think actually the first line of the piece is George's too. So maybe I should just let George wrote, wrote the, <laughs> wrote, write the whole thing. But everything else, the you know. The 4,900 words in between the first and the last piece are, are a lot of those are mine. So I, I think I did, you know, I did enough of the work to have my name on it. <laughs> it's, it's a genuinely really good story. You know, I enjoyed reading it. I, I learned a lot about Sunil Galati because like you said, there is not another sort of profile out there that covers the, like his story sort of across this sort of this time span. So I actually think it's really valuable for, for US fans to read this. Um, I also, I want to talk to you about your career a little bit, if you don't mind. Are you okay for time here? Yeah, for sure. So um, you're someone. So I, you know, I used to do some writing. Right, I was on staff at a local magazine here, and I had sort of an idea of wanting to be 
uh, like a full-time freelancer, like, you know, pitching stories to Esquire or The New Yorker or what have you. Uh, I mean, I've ended up doing, you know, obviously I do a lot more podcasting instead now. So that dream sort of never got off the ground. But you were always someone I looked at as like, oh, there's a freelancer who's figured it out. Because I feel like you do a lot of soccer stuff and I think a lot of travel stuff. I remember reading a story where you went to Ukraine um, and you seem to you seem to write on a lot of uh, different topics. Uh, so I was sort of wondering if you sort of, if you had any advice for someone who wanted to have the freelance career that you have, um, what, what sort of thing would you advise them to do? Uh, not, not for me specifically, cause I've gone a different way now, but you know, if someone else wanted the Noah, oh, yeah. that Noah Davis life where you get to review coffee shops, um, sure. <laughs> what would you have them do? <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, so, I mean, briefly I moved to New York in 2006 and to be a writer and just kind of wrote, I got a job at a restaurant basically so I could pay the bills and that was great. I'm really good at waiting tables. Uh, and, and busting tables and uh, just kind of started writing for everywhere that I could. And yeah. that eventually, you know, just kind of kept saying yes. And then they really got into the soccer stuff. Uh, I went over to the World Cup in 2006 in Germany and Greg Wallace, who's now at MLS Soccer, he was in charge of Goal.com at that point, And they were looking for people to write about the experience of being in Germany. So did that and uh, got back to the U S and he said, well, that was good. Let's, you know, keep doing this. Um, you seem like you're, you have your head on straight. And so just kind of basically just kind of kept saying yes to everything. Um, which sometimes has gotten me, uh, some assignments that were not the most fun, but you know, those, <laughs> those are interesting as well. Um, I, I, you know, in terms of advice, I mean, I don't know. I, I think, write, write as much as you can, uh, read as much as you can, which is neither of those are specific or particularly helpful. I, I do think it's a good time to be a freelancer in some ways now because so many publications are cutting back on their um, staff writers. And yeah. it's not it's not like the needs of the content has changed uh, at all. You know, they still need words to fill their pages and words to fill their websites. And, you know, a lot of websites, I mean, when I started in, in 2006, probably, I bet there were you know, maybe a dozen websites that would pay you something. And, and that was like 10 cents a word or something like that. And, you know, uh, and I, I did a lot of writing for free and, and I think that's okay. Um, as long as you, as long as it leads to something, you know, yeah, um, I think that's always the question, right? I, I get, I hear that from people a lot. Should I do this for free or should I not? Cause there's definitely something of value in your time. Um, and I think my take on it is that if it's a respectable publication or a respectable website and that clip is actually useful and looks good and you'll have a good experience maybe working with a a good editor then it's worth it but if it's just some trash website that's just thrown up a bunch of content that doesn't look great it's not worth it right because you're not you're not going to learn anything you're not going to do yourself any favors having that clip and you're not going to get paid so then then it seems like a waste of time yeah i think that's fair um i mean i think that you know getting paid is nice but you also there are other things that are important besides yeah. getting paid i mean i mean if you have you've got, you've you got have... to accumulate power as well as money Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, more power, less money. Um, although you do need to pay the rent, so yeah. you got to figure that out. Um, you know, I I think that if you have no clips at all, you probably need to write for some somewhere. Um, yeah. You know, there's also a certain an aspect of just kind of getting reps and, and writing about writing about things and figuring out what your voice is and what your style is and and how to work with an editor and. Um, you know, I, I also think in terms of I think the getting paid versus not getting paid. It's kind of kind of misses the point because, you know, it's like if you're getting paid five cents a word or 10 cents a word, I mean, that's not worth it either. Right. Like yeah, it, sure. from from a from a totally monetary perspective, if, if you're going to write, uh, you know, three thousand words and get paid one hundred and fifty dollars, um, you know, or write a thousand words and get paid one hundred dollars or whatever. I mean, that's not really going to pay the rent either. So I feel like the difference between. You know, and, and I don't know where you draw the line, but the difference between e even like 25 cents a word, um, you know, that's that's not a ton of money. Uh, mm -mm. So I, I think, you know, you want to you want to be thinking about obviously you want to be thinking about making money. And um, I think one of the things that I do best as a freelancer is, you know, think of f my my freelancing career is not a writing career. It's a small business. So. You know, I'm thinking about um, the writing is obviously important, but it's also the managing relationships with editors. It's, uh, you know, figuring out how I'm going to pay the rent. It's uh, thinking about taxes. It, it, you know, it's all these kind of 
things in terms of actually thinking about it like a business. Um, mm-hmm. Just like, you know, if you owned a, uh, a restaurant, it's too complicated, but if you owned a, <laughs> you know, a, a shop or something like that, I mean, you would, the, the product is the writing or the product is the clothes you're selling or whatever. Um, you know, so I, I think that's a, that's kind of important to, to have a little bit of a more of an analytical or, um, you know, finance kind of, you don't need a background at all, but like just to be, be comfortable with numbers or be aware of the numbers. Um, that's really helped me as well. Um, I, I think there's also, there's, you know, I do probably about like a third of the stuff I do is soccer, maybe a little more depending on, um, you know, if the U S team is playing or not, it sort of ebbs and flows. Yeah. And then a third of it is other sports probably. And a third of it is, um, kind of media and culture and, and technology. Um, and then that's a hundred percent. So I'm just, I'm just going to add some more. Um, <laughs> and then there's sort of an, another part of the, the business is, you know, the, the sponsored content and stuff like that. And I do a, a fair like amount of advertorial that. type stuff. Yeah. Kind of stuff like that. Or, um, you know, like, writing a newsletter for a um, gym, gym brand once a month. Um, you know, I, I would do that where I would talk to a couple of trainers and talk about whatever the latest uh, fitness trends were, you know, and it's like, it's kind of stuff like that. It takes like half a day and it's, um, you know, it, it, it's not my favorite thing to do. Um, it can occasionally be interesting, but it also like stuff like that pays a lot better. Mm-hmm. And so it, it lets me write uh, a 5,000 word profile of Sunil that takes a year um, you know, uh, on and off. So that's kind of the secret to a lot of soccer content, right? Is you, I think maybe some people, and the really, the reason I was asking you about this stuff is because I know there are a lot of sort of younger people out there who have sort of big dreams of, I'm just going to write about soccer all day and watch soccer all day. and It's going to be great. And that's how I'm going to make all my money. But like, I mean, even with the, you know, we do the podcast every day, Monday to Friday, but I also do some, uh, jewelry copywriting on the side, right? To make right. extra money. So it's almost like the, the reality is you've got to have your arm in something more commercial to make sure that you can support yourself. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, I, I think there's this idea that that's kind of sleazy and whatever. And I mean, sure. I, I get that. Um, I also, a couple years ago, I've written two pieces about freelancing, sort of the business of freelancing, um, that if, you know, if you're interested in this, it, they're worth reading. They're on a, or they may not worth reading, but you might be interested in them. Uh, a site called The All, and you can just oh, Google yeah. a- The All and a- Noah w- Davis. A W L. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, um, I will put links in the show notes so people can find them. Yeah, that'd be great. And um, yeah, I, I think I did the first one in 2011 or 2012, and um, you know, I had talked to, I had sort of talked to a lot of freelancers who were further along than I was you know, when I was first trying to figure out how to make it as a freelancer and kind of, um, for that piece, I probably talked to, you know, maybe 20 or 25 freelancers, um, at various stages of their career. And it kind of occurred to me after a while that everyone has like this secret little thing that they do that they don't really (laughs) talk about. And, you know, I mean, they're not, they're not embarrassed by it, but it's just kind of this thing where it's like, you know, some guy who's like, writing features for Harper's and, um, you know, a very, very well-known journalist, Mm -hmm. he, he punches up scripts for Hollywood for like, you know, 10 or $20,000 for a week or whatever. So someone sends him a script and he, you know, and he's kind of like, yeah, I mean, I don't love doing this and it's, it feels very commercial and it feels a little ridiculous. And like, occasionally I will actually have to, you know, decline a magazine feature story because I have to punch up this script. Um, but at the same time, you know, that uh that paid for a lot of the rest of his life and so it was worth it to him and and everyone has like those little those secret things or not secret but just stuff that they don't really talk about yeah uh, the stuff the stuff you don't share on facebook exactly right (laughs) um you know and, and so just kind of doing that and learning that made me feel a lot better about some of the other stuff i had done because there is sort of this um purity uh in editorial that people strive for that I don't think it ever really existed. Um, Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't think that with the economics of the media world crashing pretty dramatically and pretty quickly uh, exist in any sort of realistic sense now. I mean, I think there are certainly, you know, a handful of people who can make it as magazine writers, uh, as freelance magazine writers. But even those people, like someone comes to them with an offer that's too good to refuse and they say, okay, let's do it. You know, and and as long as you have to have a pretty – you know, a pretty good ethical sense and a pretty good understanding of what you're doing. And there are things that 
people come to me with and I say, you know, I can't do that or I don't want to do that or, um, you know, that's, that's too close to some other thing that I, that I do that's, that's editorial and I don't want to feel conflicted. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, everyone has a different line for those things. Um, and that's fine. And I think as long as, you know, my own personal thing is like, if I, you know, think about it and feel comfortable with it, like it's okay. Well, th- no, really thank you for sharing that because I think, I honestly think there's a lot of younger people listening who, you know, want to have sort of freelance soccer related careers. And I think that's really good advice is to sort of almost make everyone clear on that there's the reality is that it, you can't necessarily, even when you're really successful, it's not going to make enough money and you maybe need something else as well to make sure that it all works. Um, so yeah, like seriously, thank you for sharing because not everybody would be as open about that. I don't think, and I really like it when people, um, people are willing to sort of put it all on the table like that. Yeah, Um, of course. I mean, I also, I also think just one more point. I mean, I think that, you know, having those things that are a little bit separate, um, it it lets you be a little freer when you're writing about soccer or writing about the stuff you actually care about because you don't have to make those weird ethical choices about the soccer content. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so I think in some ways you can make the case that um, it, it's actually a lot, it's a lot better. Um, another thing I would say is that working in a restaurant is really good money. And I took a huge pay cut uh, when I stopped working in the restaurant. So um, if, you're, if you're trying to be a freelance writer, you can do worse than, you know, working three or four shifts at a restaurant a week and writing the rest of the time. Yeah, pocket some good tips, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, if you've got time, because I know we're running a little longer, do you have time to talk a little U.S. Men's National Team? Because there's a. I would big, love to talk about a, the U.S. Men's National Team. I've heard there's a big old game coming up. God, two, I think, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so, okay, I don't want to get too like uh, nerdy, tactical, specific, because um, that would obviously take a long time. Um, I guess I want to ask you, how are you feeling? Are you feeling confident or not in this? Because I've I also I've got this feeling that. For people like you and I, this kind of affects our work life as well, right? If the U.S. doesn't go to a World Cup, um, I feel like there's there's a little less work next summer. Uh, yeah, that is uh, <laughs> that is something that I actually hadn't thought about until I was watching the game against Honduras in a bar in Brooklyn, and uh, I was getting really nervous. And I'm like, not, I don't really get nervous during U.S. games. I mean, I've kind of separated my fandom uh, from my work and. You know, I, I, I don't care about the U.S. team in that fan way that I used to. Right. Um, and my friend was making fun of me. She was like, "You, uh, why are you so nervous? I've never seen you like this." And I started thinking about it. I was like, "Well, if they don't qualify for this tournament, like that's really going to like screw up my life pretty dramatically, and like a lot of <laughs> other people's lives as well." Um, so I don't know. I mean. Maybe uh, American soccer now could just become Mexican soccer now. Exactly. We'd probably make more money anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm feeling I'm feeling confident. Although I think I was pretty confident before the Costa Rica game too. And, and yeah, that same here. Very well. I, I um, was too. I was overconfident. I think. Yeah, and I actually don't think I think they if they if that exact game happened, you know, t- ten times, I think they'd probably win that game. Eight of them. I think they got a little unlucky. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I don't think that Panama is the same team that Costa Rica is. Cool, yeah. um, so I feel I feel good about that. Um, is there and, one is there one sort of like tactical specific thing you'd like to see? Like, I don't know, Christian Pulisic through the middle or Christian Pulisic out wide or, you know, is a certain player starting or not starting? Any, any one thing that makes you feel better or worse when you see the lineup? I don't know. Six more Christian Pulisic. Six um, more. OK. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I I think it's a it's a common criticism, but I, I I would like to see him in the middle. I thought it was I understand why Arena put him out wide um, to kind of get him a little more in space, but it just yeah. seemed like both Costa Rica and Honduras kind of figured that out, and they're like, okay, this is the this is the kid that makes this offense go, uh, and so just throw as many people at him as we need, and you know defend him with two guys, and then kick him when he yeah. gets by us. And it seemed like that kind of stymied the attack in, in a lot of ways. Um, I, I would like to see, I thought Fabian Johnson, um, you know, he was just coming off an injury and hadn't had much time. My hope is that. Yeah, he, you know, played, if, he played literally 10 minutes for Borussia Mönchengladbach that yeah, season before exactly. he played for the US. Yeah. Um, and he's such a strange guy because he's so good, but he just kind of doesn't seem like he fits in in some ways. He's kind of like. He's not freelancing, but he's just like on in his own world. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and so I don't know. I mean, I think it would be great if he could 
deliver in some ways, but then then it's sort of like, what do you do with Darlington Nagby, um, who I also think has, I think he's sort of been great in a different way and sort of that he's kind of got that spark and like, I, you just watch that guy dribble and you're just like, I don't know why he keeps getting by people, but he does. Yeah. And it, it's happened enough now. Um, you know, it happens in MLS a lot. And then, um, I wasn't sure if it was going to translate to international game. And, and he's done that enough in the international game against CONCACAF opponents that you're kind of like, the, I mean, there's something here. And, and I think, mm-hmm. you know, fans are sort of rightly frustrated a little bit with his lack of productivity or lack of goals and assists or whatever. But at the same time, I mean, he's, he creates stuff and, um, in a way that, you know, no one else, the only a couple guys can do. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. I, I think arena has got some interesting choices, but, I, I would like to see Pulisic in the middle because it, it clearly didn't putting him out wide. Sort of, it didn't it didn't solve the problem that they were trying to solve, which is that he would get more space, and yeah. it just it just limited. Um, you know, it kind of tilted the entire U.S. attack to the right in a way that got it all congested. And so, yeah, it felt to me I, like I, um, it puts it puts pressure on Pulisic to be like, okay, you're the guy that's going to do everything for us, but also you're going to have to do it from all the way on that right wing and right. they're going to send one or two guys over to kick you. So exactly. <laughs> good luck. And it seemed to me also that I heard Bruce Arena talk about he wanted Pulisic to figure out how to make the best use of being fouled. And it seemed to me that near the end of the Honduras game, when he played central, he really did get fouled dribbling through the middle. That's the free kick the US got that they eventually equalized from after didn't Kelly Acosta hit the bar and then we eventually scored on the rebound. So it seems like yeah. if he's going to get fouled, get him fouled in the middle where it's a more dangerous chance than getting fouled over on the touchline. Exactly. Yeah. I, I would like to see him uh, deal with the fouls a little bit better too. Um, How do you mean? He, he, he gets very frustrated. Um, mm. And it's kind of something that I noticed, you know, and during the during the games in the spring, and um, I thought it really, you know, there's especially against Costa Rica. I mean, I, I was at Red Bull Arena, so I think I could see it maybe a little bit better than you can see it on television. But at Red Bull Arena, he just like there's so much gesticulating and so much frustration, and it kind of took him out of his game a little bit. Um, and I, I know it's I I can't imagine that it's fun to get hacked all the time, and he's uh, not getting protected by the referees, um, but. You know, I, I hope that he understands that that's just going to happen. I mean, that's what that's what happens yeah. when you're the best the best player on the U.S. team is you get your butt kicked, uh, right. and you get knocked over, and that's what happens at Concacaf, and you're not going to get protected. Um, it's not also, it's not what happens in the Bundesliga, right? When you're not quite the star player, you're, you're not even right. guaranteed to be in the starting eleven. And you know, there's different standards of refereeing, and different like teams aren't just scared of Christian Pulisic. When you're, you know, when you're Hoffenheim or you're Bayern, you're not necessarily just all about let's stop this guy. You've got other things to focus on. Whereas I think right. some teams in Concacaf may be sort of putting a lot more focus on let's stop this guy, and here's how we do it. Exactly. And he also doesn't play defense when he's on the right, which is yeah. which is strange to see. And he sort of, I don't know if it it might not uh, come through. Graham Zuzzi's well. got it covered. Graham Zuzzi's got it covered. Don't worry. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was uh, he. You know, he's a, he's wonderful at pressing, but in terms of kind of positionally, especially when the ball is over on the other side of the field, he he does not. Uh, he doesn't sort of take up the space that he needs to. And that, that was a little, you saw Zussi get overrun at mm-hmm. moments. And, you know, some of that is Zussi not being, a, a, you know, learning how to play right back. Um, but some of it is also, he's, you know, he's got two on one because yeah. Pulisic is not, is not back there. So All right. So I think we've made the case pretty strongly for Pulisic in the middle. Let's hope, let's hope Bruce Arena pays attention. Unless there are six of them and then they can put them everywhere. Yeah, Pulisic's everywhere as far as the eye can see. Exactly. <laughs> I know. Um, anything else you want to talk about before we uh, before we call it a day? I feel like it's been a good chat, so I've really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> this is great. Thanks for having me. All right. Yeah, it's better without John Arnold. Oh, always. Everything's better without John Arnold. <laughs> Hello to John Arnold if he does listen. Um, all right, Noah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me um, and uh, best of luck with everything. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>